1123, the age of crusades in the Holy Land. The Christian king of Jerusalem is overwhelmed by a powerful enemy. The king, Baldwin II, is captured by his greatest foe, the Turkish warrior chieftain Balak. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, the Christian queen, Morphia, is devastated by the news of her husband's capture, but she's not willing to sit idle. The queen formulates a daring plan to free her beloved from Balak's dungeon. She can't take on Balak directly, but she can use her cunning. How will she do it? Find out today on Real Crusades History. Guys, before we get into today's episode from Crusades History, I'd like to announce that this video is proudly sponsored by NordVPN. A lot of you know that I'm pretty picky about taking on sponsorships. I only partner with companies that I personally believe in. In my opinion, a VPN is essential. A VPN allows you to maintain privacy for your internet activity for around three bucks monthly in the two-year plan, basically the price of a cup of coffee. NordVPN protects your internet traffic with cutting edge security technologies. Nord is easy to use. Connect with one click or enable auto connect for zero click protection. It's confirmed by the speed test. Nord is the fastest VPN out there. Your account can be activated on six devices. I personally am a user of NordVPN and I can say that they provide an excellent service with great customer care. I know that Nord is offering a service that can truly benefit my subscribers and so I am glad to partner with them. To celebrate NordVPN's 10th birthday, go to nordvpn.com slash realcrusadeshistory to get the two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus one month free and a bonus gift. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. And with that, guys, let's get on to the video. Baldwin II became ruler of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem in 1118. He was one of the original Frankish Crusaders who'd captured Jerusalem in 1099. By the time he became king, he was already married. Baldwin's wife was Morphia, daughter of Gabriel, the wealthy Armenian lord of Melitene. When the Crusaders arrived, Gabriel struck an alliance with them by offering Baldwin his daughter in marriage. Although they came from two very different cultures, Baldwin and Morphia proved to be a love match. They were devoted to one another. In an age when many powerful men kept mistresses, Baldwin was entirely loyal to his wife. The Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, situated in Palestine, was surrounded by Muslim kingdoms, and the Crusaders warred constantly with regional Muslim princes. When Baldwin II was named king, it was in the midst of a struggle. The Ortigid Turks were gaining power in northern Syria, though Baldwin II, leading his army, managed to hurl them back. But the Ortigids continued to gain in strength. A new Ortigid chieftain, Balak, forged a power base in the north of Syria and clashed with one of Baldwin's chief vassals, Jocelyn, the Count of Edessa. In September of 1122, Count Jocelyn and his knight Walloran were ambushed by Balak's cavalry near Saruj to the southwest of Edessa. Jocelyn was outnumbered, but he and his small force tried to fight back, charging Balak's ranks. However, the weather turned bad, and heavy rains muddied the field. The chronicler Fulker of Chartres describes the incident. Jocelyn, Count of Edessa, was captured, and Walloran, his kinsman, with him. Not less than a hundred of Jocelyn's men were slain. They were craftily ambushed by the Emir Balak. The imprisonment of one of the most important lords in the Crusader Kingdom spread alarm among the Christians. King Baldwin marched north to see the defenses of the county of Edessa. With his knights, Baldwin secured Edessa's frontier castles and cleared the region of Balak's raiding parties. In April of 1123, Baldwin was patrolling the northeastern portion of the county when he received terrible news, as described here by the chronicler Ibn Alathir. Balak, lord of Karput, besieged the castle of Karkar. The Franks in Syria heard this news, and Baldwin, king of the Franks, marched there with his troops to raise the siege, fearing Balak would grow powerful if he captured it. When Balak heard of his approach, he moved to meet him. 
They clashed in battle, and the Franks were defeated. The king was taken prisoner, along with a number of his leading knights. Balak couldn't believe his good fortune. Now he not only held the Count of Edessa, but the King of Jerusalem himself. At once, Balak sent Baldwin to the castle Carput, where the king shared a common dungeon with his friend and vassal, Jocelyn. It must have been a sobering moment for the two old comrades who'd fought side by side for so long. With her two most important leaders imprisoned, the Crusader Kingdom might have devolved into chaos. The fact that it didn't is a testament to the strength of Frankish political institutions. The knights and clergy of the Kingdom of Jerusalem acted in harmony to secure the realm. The Patriarch of Jerusalem, Varmund, the leading clergyman of the kingdom and a close friend to Baldwin, called a council of the great men to secure the administration and determine how to help the king. Meanwhile, the Queen of Jerusalem, Baldwin's Armenian wife, Morphia, was deeply disturbed to learn of her husband's capture. At the time, she was at Jerusalem with her four daughters, ranging in age from the teenaged Melisend to the four-year-old Jovetta. It must have been a terrifying moment for the queen and the four royal princesses. But Morphia wasn't content to sit and wait. She called upon the resources of her own people, gathering together a band of Armenian warriors to address the crisis. First, Morphia dispatched spies into Balak's lands to determine where her husband was being held. The Armenians learned that Baldwin's prison was Karput, a remote and well-defended fortress in the heart of enemy territory. Fortunately for Morphia, the Armenians she'd gathered together were well-versed in stealth. A plan was hatched for Morphia's band, composed of around 50 Armenians, to sneak into Balak's lands and try to free the King of Jerusalem. Disguised as merchants, the Armenians traveled to Karput. Here they were allowed entry into the castle, along with others who had regular business inside. Castles served economic as well as military functions, so it was not unusual for sellers to enter in to do business. However, once inside, the Armenians threw off their disguises, took out their swords and attacked the Turkish garrison. Totally surprised, Balak's men were quickly overwhelmed and slain. At once, the Armenians freed Baldwin and Jocelyn from the dungeon, handing them swords. Baldwin, Jocelyn, and the other Franks joined the Armenians in storming through the castle and slaying what remained of the garrison. Some of the Frankish knights still had chains on their arms as they cut down the shocked Turkish troops. Before long, the king and the count found themselves masters of Karput with a band of Armenian warriors to help them defend it. Baldwin must have been thanking God for having given him such a resourceful wife as his beloved Morphia. The Armenian takeover of Karput was a truly impressive feat. With only a small force, these tough warriors managed to sneak into a well-fortified castle, overwhelm its defenders, and take control in a brilliantly executed operation. But now the situation was perilous. Karput was deep within Balak's realm, and Baldwin knew that he couldn't hold it for long. Almost immediately, Turkish reinforcements arrived and began to surround the castle. It was only a matter of time before Balak arrived with a thirst for vengeance. To complicate things, the king found that Balak's harem was filled with Christian Armenian women, many of whom had helped in the takeover of the castle in the initial fray. Between the Armenian warriors, the women, and the Franks who had been sprung from the dungeons, the king had a fair number of people to consider. He couldn't just lead them all out of Karput. They'd all be captured and surely executed by Balak. Instead, Baldwin decided to send Jocelyn along with two Armenians to sneak out of Balak's territory to seek aid from the Crusader states. If the Crusaders could get an army to Karput, Baldwin could at least hold it until they arrived. Jocelyn agreed, and the plan was put into action. It's remarkable that the king didn't elect to sneak out of the castle himself. He easily could have but instead, he chose to remain in this perilous situation with those who had fought so bravely for his freedom.
In the dead of night, Jocelyn, joined by two Armenian warriors, snuck down over the walls of Karpu. Unnoticed, the three slipped through the Turkish forces camped outside the castle. Together, Jocelyn and his comrades passed stealthily through Balak's domain, hiding by day and moving overland by night. At last, Jocelyn crossed the river Euphrates and entered his own territory, the county of Edessa. A peasant recognized Jocelyn and welcomed him with joy, for Jocelyn had been generous to his family. With the help of this peasant and other locals, Jocelyn returned to his fortress of Turbacel, where his men rejoiced at his return. At once, Jocelyn rode to Antioch, where he demanded that the patriarch of the city, Bernard, join him in raising an army to rescue the king. But the patriarch refused, insisting that the mission was too dangerous. Greatly annoyed at this, Jocelyn sent word further south to Jerusalem, asking for troops to help in his rescue mission. There, the Patriarch Varbund and the Constable at once gathered the city's forces and prepared to join Jocelyn for the daring operation. However, the refusal of the Patriarch of Antioch to help would have consequences, for this gave Balak time to react to the coup of Karput. Rapidly, Balak brought his army up before Karput and surrounded the castle. Balak called up to King Baldwin on the castle's walls, insisting that if only the king would surrender the fortress, he would be allowed to depart for his own lands. Baldwin did not trust Balak and knew well that the emir would never allow him to escape so easily. The Christian chronicler William of Tyre recounts the scene. The king, however, felt confidence in the strength of the citadel and hoped that with the assistance of those who had joined him there, he might be able to hold the place by force until aid arrived. He therefore rejected the offered terms and continued to defend the fortress vigorously. Enraged, Balak brought up his siege equipment and began pounding at the castle walls. The Armenians and the Franks put up a valiant defense hoping all the while to see Jocelyn arriving with reinforcements. However, Balak's siege machines prevailed. The wall was breached and Balak's turfs poured into the castle. The emir showed no mercy. He gathered up all the Armenians, the women included, and hurled them to their deaths over the castle walls. Only the king, Walleron, and a few of the Franks were spared, as they were too valuable to be killed. This must have been a devastating moment for the king, who'd risked everything to stand with these heroic men and women. Baldwin must have been wondering what had become of Jocelyn's rescue effort. Little did he know that Antioch's patriarch Bernard had failed to provide the needed help. King Baldwin and Walleron were transferred even deeper into Balak's territory, to the fortress of Haran. Meanwhile, Jocelyn was on his way with the forces of Edessa and Jerusalem only to learn about the fate of Karput. Haran was too far away to carry out a rescue mission. Disheartened, Count Jocelyn turned back, surely cursing the Patriarch of Antioch. This was not the outcome for which Queen Morphia had prayed. After the initial success of her men, she must have been devastated to learn of the recent events at Karput. Nevertheless, she refused to quit. She at once dispatched a message to Balak, asking to open negotiations for her husband's freedom. But things began to go badly for Balak. One of his own vassals, the emir of Menbij, rebelled against him. Balak arrived with his army to try to suppress the rebellion, but he was struck with a stray arrow. As he lay bleeding to death in his tent, Balak mumbled that his end would be a disaster for the Muslims. Now Balak's relative Timurtash took power among the Ortikids. Timurtash was far less warlike than the late Balak, and simply wanted to profit from King Baldwin as quickly as possible. He handed the Frankish king over to the emir of Shizar, Sultan, asking him to negotiate a hefty price with the Franks for the release of their king. Queen Morphia joined Count Jocelyn in the county of Edessa to arrange for the king's release. 
Timur Tosh demanded a high price. He wanted 80,000 dinars and the fortresses of Athareb, Azaz, Kafarteb, and Zardana. 20,000 dinars were to be given over in advance along with prestigious hostages. Baldwin's youngest daughter, the Princess Jovetta, and Jocelyn's son, also called Jocelyn, a boy of 11. These were hard conditions, but the Queen and Count agreed to them. The Princess and young Jocelyn were to be guarded over by their own entourage of Franks and Arminians at Shizar. The Emir Sultan of Shizar was on good terms with the Crusaders, and Morphia and Jocelyn believed that the hostages would be well treated during their time in Sultan's household. After the hostages were handed over and the first installment paid, King Baldwin, at last, was released from captivity. Riding the stallion on which he'd been originally captured, he departed Haran in June of 1124 and rode with his men to Shizar to visit the hostages and confer with Sultan. The king found that the hostages and their entourages were indeed afforded rich accommodations at Shizar. Sultan received Baldwin as honored guest and treated him to a lavish banquet. Finally, Baldwin departed and by August arrived in Antioch, where he was at last reunited with his beloved wife and queen, Morphia, and his companion in arms, Count Jocelyn. At Antioch, King Baldwin moved to carry out the terms of his ransom. However, once again, the Patriarch Bernard of Antioch proved an obstacle. The castle's promise to Timur Tosh belonged to the Principality of Antioch, and Bernard insisted that Baldwin had no right to hand them over to the enemy. Whether willingly or not, Baldwin ultimately agreed that Bernard was correct, and sent word to Timur Tosh, informing him apologetically that he could not honor the original agreement made by his wife and his vassal. Timur Tosh, a far softer man than the late Balak, agreed to alter the deal and simply asked for the remainder of the ransom. But Baldwin was short of funds. Timur Tosh had shown weakness, and Baldwin decided to try to pressure him further. Joining with Count Jocelyn, he launched an attack on Aleppo, the heart of the Ordechid power base. The chronicler Fulker of Chartres says that Baldwin was trying to force Timur Tosh to release the hostages or to take the city itself, which was suffering from a famine at the time. Timur Tosh neglected to defend Aleppo. He remained at the main Ortikid fortress of Mardin and ignored pleas from Aleppo's garrison for assistance. For three long months, Baldwin and his allies harassed the town. Desperate for help, the Muslim defenders sent an embassy east to the ruler of Mosul, the Atabeg of Il Bursuki. With Balak dead, Bursuki saw the opportunity to expand his own power in northern Syria. At once, Bursuki sent his officers to take control of the garrison at Aleppo. Meanwhile, Bursuki formed an alliance with the powerful Emir of Damascus. Combining their armies, they sent out to relieve Aleppo. Hearing of their advance, Baldwin withdrew, returning to Antioch in January of 1125. The Arab chronicler Ibn al-Khalanisi recounts how this bolstered Bursuki's reputation. By this noble action, Il Bursuki acquired great merit and renown, and having entered Aleppo, he governed it with uprightness and protected the interests of its people, and made every effort to defend the city and keep the enemy at a distance from it. Now ruler of Mosul and Aleppo, Bursuki received the backing of the Sultan in Baghdad. Tadakin of Damascus submitted to him as a vassal. Bursuki was now the most powerful Muslim prince in the north of Syria, and poised to launch a major campaign against King Baldwin. In May, Bursuki and Tadakin launched an invasion of Crusader lands. They sacked and captured the fort of Kafarteb in the Principality of Antioch and laid siege to Zardana. King Baldwin responded immediately. He gathered the Jerusalem army and was joined by the Knights of Edessa under Jocelyn. Baldwin led the Crusaders towards Zardana. Before this advance, 
Bersuki withdrew, moving northeast to attack the Crusader castle of Azaz. Baldwin followed him, and there, on June 11, 1125, the Crusaders and the Turks clashed in one of the fiercest battles in the history of the Crusades. The Crusaders were outnumbered. Bersuki and Tadakin trusted their superior numbers and launched a direct attack. Baldwin and Jocelyn executed a feigned retreat. Drawn in by the ruse, the Turks gave chase. At a pre-planned location, the Crusaders veered around and gave charge. Fulker of Chartres describes the moment. Our king, seeing this, hesitated no longer, but armed with the protection of prayer and the sign of the cross, shouted, God help us. With a loud blast of the trumpets, he attacked the Turks and ordered his men to do the same, for they did not dare to begin the battle until the king had ordered it. The Turks, in truth, at first resisted bravely. Then, by the will of the creator of the universe, they wilted in despair and became confused by the great carnage, and those who could turned and scattered in flight. The Muslim chronicler Ibn al-Khalanisi also recounts the battle. The two armies met, and the army of the Muslims was broken and dispersed, with severe losses in killed and captives. The Muslim forces fled in disarray pursued by the Crusaders who seized their baggage. The battle was a decisive victory for the Christians. From the booty collected, King Baldwin amassed the funds to redeem his daughter and Jocelyn's son. The Princess Jovetta and young Jocelyn were reunited with their families. Bersuki fled to Mosul where his prestige collapsed. One year later, Bersuki was stabbed to death in the Great Mosque of Mosul by the notorious Order of the Assassins. King Baldwin was left as the dominant power in the north of Syria. In Jerusalem, the royal family was reunited at last. It must have been a great relief to Queen Morphia, who'd first endured the loss of her husband and then her daughter. Baldwin and Morphia remained united as both rulers and spouses faithful to one another until the end. During their tenure, the Crusader states flourished and grew in power. The history featured in this video is the basis for my historical novel of the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Follow the link in the description below to get a copy. Now that you've watched this video, check out our documentary on the epic battle of Tours when Charles Martel faced the Umayyads in 732. Click on the video linked on your screen.